colleagues, I would like to start. Can I invite the rapporteur to join us on the podium? Mrs. Morfai has a point of order before we start <laughs> Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I do have a point of order, and that point of order is that um, I think it should be considered uh uh, a necessity that maybe this inquiry proceedings uh, uh, should uh, just uh, be cancelled due to the lack of interest on the part of members of, uh, uh, of the European Parliament. If the camera turns around and shows to the European taxpayers how their resources are spent, how many empty seats are there, when the Tavares report was on the podium about Hungary, then everybody was here. Now nobody is here. There are all these whistleblowers and the people who risk their life in order that we can find out what happened, uh, all these uh, major human rights violations. I think it's a disaster that, uh, that uh, it seems that about 10 percent of the members are interested. I'm a non-attached member. I have no right to go with the delegation to Washington to, to take part in the, okay, in the work. Okay, Mrs. Morfai, no right that's, that's, to, that's, to not that's not a point of order. Um, I very much agree with you that the, uh, the empty room or the absence of many colleagues is very deplorable. However, I do not think uh, that because we are very few to ask questions that we are wrong to ask questions. I think it's very important that it's done. I also know that these sessions are being watched live via web stream by many, many people. You've also heard that our, our previous guest speakers were very grateful for the opportunity to get a podium to tell their story. So I think it is important important work that we, are, that we are doing here, and I have no intention of cancelling the meeting. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to start now. I welcome uh, um, our guest speakers and the rapporteur. I'm going to introduce you, but first um, I'm going to uh, explain the, um, the organization of the meeting uh, this afternoon because we're going to change it a little bit, uh, and I can imagine that there are colleagues um, who are going to be unhappy. If so, you can, um, you can uh, uh, kill me. We've all agreed that we're going to work this way, but I'm happy to take the responsibility. It's like this, and if I look at the room, it's not going to be a problem for the time being. Um, only the rapporteur and the shadows are going to uh, ask any questions, and I'm happy, Mrs. Moravai, uh, that you would speak on behalf of the non-aligned members, given that you're also the only non-aligned uh, present here, so you'll get the floor. So only the, the rapporteur and the shadow rapporteurs and Mrs. Morvai, you'll get two minutes maximum to ask a question, and I'm really going to be brutal. Where's the hammer? Here it is. Then um, the speakers are going to get a maximum of two minutes to respond to the questions, um, and then you can get a, a follow-up question for a maximum of one minute, okay, and an answer of one minute. So we'll have a max of six minutes, per speaker. That's the only way that we're going to get relevant questions, relevant answers, uh, and that we'll also be able to finish on time. And of course, if there is time left, then other members can also get the floor. That is, that's self-evident. I should have said that. But uh, I, I know this is not a very nice arrangement, but it's the only way that we can get a meaningful uh, debate here, because last time people were a bit frustrated that they asked questions and then the, the, there were no answers. So, um, Having said all that, um, I'm, I'm grateful to, uh, to welcome here, uh, first of all, Mr. Geert Standaert, who's the Vice President of the Service Delivery Engine Belgacom, and Mr. Dirk Liebart, Secretary General of Belgacom. Uh, I'm also welcoming for the second round of questions Mr. Frank Robben of the um, um, Commission de la Protection de la Vie Privée Belgique, who is the co-rapporteur on the dossier Belgacom. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm not welcoming uh, Mr. Loban. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. Uh, this is a bit the policy of the empty seat. Uh, previously, uh, representatives of the U.S. government and the Dutch government have also refused to be here, and I think it is deplorable that governments are not willing to um, be held to account by the European citizens. So I'm not going to uh, delay this any further. I'm, I'm going to invite in this order, Mr. Standard and Mr. Liebart to do their short introductions, and then we'll get to questions and answers. Mr. Standard, you have the floor. Meneer de voorzitter, geachte leden van de commissie. Chairman. Sorry, uh, Madam Chairman. Got off on the wrong step. On the 16th of September, Belgacom made it known that there was an extensive operation 
concerning its IT security following a digital hack uh, that Belgacom was made aware of. In the following days, this cyber incident became known as a quite broad-ranging incident and was spread in the press. Belgacom would like to thank you for the invitation to be here today and we would like to give a brief overview of the uh, incident itself to be able to then be able to field questions and in doing so to allow uh, the debate to thrive in this debate. If I may just point out the or recall the chronology on the 21st of June this year the Belgacom expert sounded the alarm when it was noted that there were anomalies in the IT network in Belgacom had uh, been subjected to malware. Then we had Fox I2 came in as experts who worked together with the Belgacom experts to look into the incident thoroughly. The f initial conclusions on the 12th of July showed that there had been a digital attack in which a complex and unknown a previously unknown virus had entered the Belgacom IT system on the 19th of July. Belgacom took a case to the federal prosecu prosecutors in Brussels. The investigation was started straight away with the computer crime unit and the state security services. We, Belgacom provided every assistance to the inquiry and we intend to carry on that and have employed external specialists to help out. Our initial focus was to look into the, what the virus was and to try and map what sort of virus it was. We wanted to look at whether there were problems with uh, customers being affected or cu customer data having been compromised. There were no proof of those, however. The virus was only found in the internal IT network of Belgacom and therefore not in the Belgacom Telecom network, the mobile network, nor the fast li uh, fixed line network. The uh, database of customer information didn't seem to be compromised either. Extra uh, surveillance was put in place to follow this up to see if anything there were any developments. The experts involved tried to bring about a remediation strategy to bear and the knowledge that came to light between the middle of July and September were essential to be able to localise and eliminate the virus. We worked together with Fox IT specific scanning and cleaning tools which were developed to do that. When it appeared that these tools were indeed successfully tested on the 4th of September, the green light was given for a fundamental cleanup operation that took place over the weekend of the 14th and 15th of September. To give you an idea, the Belgacom network is comprised of about 26,600 IT systems and the 124 IT systems where malware was actually found. This has been replaced or uh, dealt with in another way. We carried out this operation after carrying out thorough preparation. You can imagine that you had to be meticulous in the way that you approach this in the sequencing and that is an operation that we managed to uh, carry out. There was no effect on customers nor service provision and since then we've had intensive monitoring in place and it's part of our extended prevention plan. Our complete IT network is being continually uh, scanned to detect new malware attacks. Since the cleanup, to date, there have been no infections that have been established, but we will remain vigilant looking to the future. Belgacom is working on the le legal investigation. We hope in the longer term there'll be light shed on this as to who it was who did this and their motives. At the moment, we do not have any uh, objective elements to confirm or deny any of the speculations that have, has been uh, reflected in the press reports. We're happy to answer questions you might have. However, we are not in a position to provide information that is covered by uh, the uh, pending uh, legal investigation. 
and uh, seeing as there is a legal investigation it is before the courts in Brussels you'll understand we can't give you that sort of information because it could compromise the legal investigation and finally we can't provide any information that might have any impact on the safety of the IT system of Belgacom and given that we are very happy to field any questions you might have. Dank u wel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Standard. Then the uh, next one to take the floor, Mr. Liebart, Secretary General of Belgacom. So I have nothing to add to the statement of uh, my colleague. Thank you. Thank you very much. That leaves us much more time for questions <coughs> and answers. First one uh, is our rapporteur, Mr. Moraes, for two minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Standard and Mr. Liebart. Um, let me. Um, I've got to thank you both. Uh, let me um, begin with the legal case. I mean, it, it, first of all, to thank you both for coming. Um, it's obvious from the fact that you've reported after the internal investigation uh, your findings to the Belgian prosecutor. Um, what we are doing here is we are investigating the allegations in Der Spiegel um, today and we want to find out as much as we can um, as to how compromised uh, Belgacom has been and then we want to try and find as much information as we can. Now, the, um, we appreciate we, you can't say much about the legal case, but if you um, have reported to the Belgian prosecutors, that means there is a prima facie case, um, otherwise you couldn't report to the Belgian prosecutors. So can you tell us um, what that simple case is? Clearly there was a, a digital attack, there was a hacking, but how proximate is that to what was reported in Der, Der Spiegel? Um, so are the allegations true or are they not true in, in your opinion? And can you give us some sense of that? Secondly, um, the Belgian Prime Minister talked about a violation of your public firm's integrity. Can you comment on how serious you think this incident has been for your firm's integrity and give us some sense of where you would pitch um, that situation? Um, and I think we are looking for um, a sense of how you feel um, your company has been compromised, given that this is a situation where Belgacom um, is a, a major company with integrity, but it also serves the European institutions, and how you feel um, that has compromised your company in serving these institutions as well as uh, serving um, the infrastructure in, in Belgium. Thank you. I'm, just, I'm going to be really strict today, so if you overrun your time, it will be deducted from your follow-up question. You have two minutes for answering. With your permission, Madam Chairman, perhaps I could start by replying to the points regarding the judicial inquiries. Now, it is the case that in Belgium, when a telecom operator reports an attack on its IT system, there is a requirement to re report this to the legal system. We did so as soon as it was established that there was indeed an organized attack underway on the integrity of our system. Now, the fact that we lodged such a complaint in no way implies that, that we as uh, a firm are casting expressions at any particular attacker. In the Spiegel, that they may be setting out particular scenarios, but we as a firm would not speculate on the identification of the attacker. It's up to the judicial authorities to make the necessary inquiries and establish who is behind this. Let the tracking to your then, in reply to your question regarding European institutions, what I could tell you is that up until now, we found some malware on our internal IT system. Of course, there is a, a firm firewall be between our internal system and our, our network systems. The, the final network. 
so there's no malware on our uh, overall network such as would uh, affect our users so th there's no evidence that um, they have been affected Thunder. might I just add that the elements of the uh, attack were subject to uh, legal secrecy until the 24th of September thereafter we were able to report a number of points to the relevant body we were talking about the, the signature of the traffic and the external IP address used for the intrusion. We in informed the regulator of this as well as the federal police and all the, the relevant Belgian bodies. Um, we've also involved EU, which is responsible for the safety of, of all the European institutions. So your authorities are aware of what needs to be done to check whether your systems m might have been undermined by the same malware. What we found is that there's been no overflow of malware from our internal system to our customers and by the same token presumably not to European institutions either. Follow-up question? Are you satisfied? No? Okay, that brings us to the shadows. Mr. Voss for two minutes. Um, thank you and thank you also for your statements. In your last answer you already partly answered my question. I'm not that well versed in technology but as far as I'm able to follow if data are hacked into and sent on can you follow what happens to the data and also what sort of quality of data can be obtained are we talking about connection data or are we talking about content data and as to the suspicion that this attack emanated from the United Kingdom has any information come to you uh, to that effect or do you have your information from the media alone well, I can confirm that there's been nobody who has approached us at all and we can only base uh, our knowledge on the facts and to date there is no indication that would lead us to any perpetrator nor any motive for the attack. Yeah. Okay, you want to follow a question? Also so dass man im Grunde auch davon ausgeht so one could assume that other countries could account for this attack not going on what was in the paper and also my question about the quality of the data can you say something about the quality of the data are these things that really impinge on privacy or are we just talking about data relating to connections made I'm not sure exactly about the composition of this malware. Um, well, given the current information that we have at our disposal, there are no anomalies that have been established concerning uh, accessing network information nor anything going through our networks. So the anomalies have only been established on our side in the internal IT network. So Windows servers, for example, typical office applications that uh, are used by our internal staff. And concerning your first question, the origin of this intrusion, while well, there are no facts that can give us any indication of who could have done this 
and, and what they wanted to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, today, in contrast to um, the previous session, I will just take my own all the place in the order of shadows, if you don't mind. I'll put the question in, um, in Dutch. Allereerst, u zegt de First of all, you are saying that Belcom experts were the ones who, who spotted the intruders. Is that actually the, the case, or was there outside help within the EU? And then you say you're not sure who, who they were and what um, they were after. But is this a similar pattern to what happened in 2011, where we found that systems within the EU institutions, including the, the European Parliament, had been affected? Could we not draw the conclusion that the British Secret Services were involved in both instances? A third question. You say there's the, on the, the 14th, 15th December, there was a big uh, clearing up operation, and now everything's clean. Is that actually the case? What do you make of re reports that the Cisco core routers are still infected by malware? And we, we heard that from Cisco in the European Parliament. Uh, then, four, three, why was it that last week, Belcom voted for uh, sending uh, Armix um, data uh, to so that it is accessible to the US? And then, why is the code name for the British Secret Services might be called Operation Socialist? Okay, dus uh, met betrekking tot uw eerste vraag. Uh... Well, in reply to your first question, yes, indeed, it was Belgian Com experts who discovered this had happened. Of course, our Belgian Com experts did work together with uh, our suppliers, HP and Microsoft. We established that we're talking about malware that, together with them, but we triggered this to, to our, our uh, subcontractors. We brought in Fox IT, it's the specialist in the area. Then we were able to uh, categorize the malware and establish that it was a highly sophisticated type of malware. Your second question. Regarding what, what was found in the European institutions, my colleague, the information was sent to the uh, EU should indicate whether or not this is identical to the intrusions in 2011. We have no information on that at all. And then, can I also bevestigen met betrekking tot u? Then, on your next question. The fact is that up until now, everything does seem to be clean. We're constantly monitoring the system, but all our IT systems do seem to be clean. We haven't found any traces of malware on our network, and that applies to the Cisco router, amongst others. And then on your iMix question, that really doesn't ring any bells with us. You, you may have um, voted for that. We took no initiative on it. Mr. Nittard, well, I'll show you the, the list after the meeting. And then, is your last uh, and then your last point was on the, the code name Socialist that was mentioned in Der Spiegel. Well, there we should recall that the, the story in Der Spiegel is just one of the, the possible hypotheses. It's not one that we can exclude, nor is it one and that, that we can confirm. I have no follow-up questions. Uh, shadow for the Greens, Jan Albrecht, for two minutes. Thank you very much. First of all, let me say that it's absolutely unacceptable that uh, there's no representative by the GCHQ and that the UK government is uh, answering in such an unacceptable manner. Uh, I think we should call on all national governments of the European Union uh, to react to this uh, immediately because um, I think that it's not about uh, national security and their application in member states. It's about an extraterritorial aggression inside the European Union. 
and that has to be answered, and that has to be also elaborated here in the European Parliament, and uh, I think we should insist on this being a matter of further discussions. Then to my questions. First of all, thank you for being here. Um, I have uh, a, one very detailed question with regard to your internal IT security systems. Could you elaborate in what way they, there have been effects inside the internal uh, IT uh, systems which you uh, refer to? So um, uh, what has been compromised there exactly? And, uh, have, are there also subsidiaries like your own service BICS involved in uh, those um, if, uh, as those, those activities which could be affected, and uh, are you, uh, as you are the main shareholder of the, uh, this daughter service, I would like to ask if you know that the BICS also uh, offers uh, other services and which services, for example, uh, to the European Parliament, to the Commission, or to the NATO. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Standard, Mr. Liebert. Well, perhaps I can answer your question on BIX first, which is a Belgacom subsidiary where they are meant to ensure good language and communication services between the different networks at an international level. That means that the service of BIX, voice, SMS, roaming and others, if you like, provide the link between the hundred operators that you'll find spread around the world. The customers of BIX do not include the European Parliament nor the European Union. They are operators. One of the customers is Belgacom. So we're not just a shareholder of BIX, we're also a customer of BIX. And BIX used to be an integral part of Belgacom. It used to be an internal department of Belgacom. And it's only since August 2004 that it's become a separate uh, subsidiary. So you might say that there are still links between the IT network of Belgacom and the IT network of BIX. And indeed, we did find malware present in Belgacom and in BIX. To give you an answer to the possible follow-up question as to whether BIX was the actual target or Belgacom, we really do not know. And that's something we cannot say then for in any certainty today. Maybe I can just add to that, that we don't know how this intrusion took place. To date, we have no indication of how that was done. And what I can say on where the malware was, it was only on the internal IT systems. And there's a clear partition between the internal IT systems and the networks. Of course, we checked our networks. There was no malware present there. We haven't found any malware to date there. So it's internal IT systems. Typically, we're talking about office applications, that sort of thing that is used internally. We have more than 26,000 systems, as I mentioned. We have these Windows servers and a number of workstations, PC stations, where we did find malware. And there are 124 where it was found, so and 67, uh, 60 or 70 uh, PCs. Just one short follow-up question, uh, which is a bit more general. Um, think it would be proven that this aggression, this uh, illegal access to your information systems, wa was coming from the GCHQ. How do you think that would affect your business and would you think that it would be acceptable that the Belgian government doesn't act against the United Kingdom with regard to such an uh, infringement of your integrity? Thank you very much. Well, Ene, this is a speculative. Well, that's a very speculative question, isn't it? Which means that my answer will have to be fairly cautious, but maybe I can just point out to you the statement that was made by the Prime Minister 
that this incident was something that we knew about but the reports in the press claimed that they know who was behind it and if that were the case that we understood who was behind it of course Belgium would react strongly. That brings us to uh, the ECR, no representative present. Uh, that brings us then to Mrs. Ernst for Gue, two minutes. Yeah, vielen Dank. Thank you. Three questions. Before I ask them, let me just say this is a question of the integrity of the telecoms infrastructure in an entire country which is being affected. I think we need to emphasize the scale of it. Now, I'm talking about a loss of trust on the part of citizens when the law is broken like that. But I think we need a very thorough analysis of the situation and we shouldn't remain at a superficial level. Three questions. Firstly, the hacking technology in the Spiegel Quantum Insert QI is the software named. What do you know about this program? Is it a software program? Who made it? What sort of information do you have on it? I'd like to hear. The second point, I'm not very happy with what's been said about who's affected. You've said, OK, the customers weren't affected. It affected the internal IT. Well, I can understand what you're saying, but I've read since 2010 we've seen espionage attempts on this level. So what sort of effects have there been on your own internal systems? What sort of damage has been inflicted? How do you assess the situation? You went to a court uh, about it ultimately and also you talked about a contingency planning or an intervention plan. Can you say something about that? Are you sure that everything's more secure and everything's being checked? Uh, can you say something about that more specifically? Mr. Liebert. Um, met betrekking tot de software zelf. On the software itself, what we can tell you that we are dealing with a highly sophisticated piece of software. And we can say that the people who've developed this software obviously had a very broad range of possibilities and abilities and a lot of expert knowledge. It was highly sophisticated software, which means that the hackers, I'm sure, have considerable resources behind them. On the reference you made to 2010, we discovered the virus at the end of Ju June, and we took all necessary measures straight away the exact date when this was uh, first uh, established in our IT systems is not easy to work out and this is being looked at by the judicial inquiry. On the prevention plan uh, we do need a lot of information and the uh, some of the information we have is not necessary things we can pass on to you um, but I can tell you that we do benchmark with the other telecom operators and so we do exchange best practices that exist at the moment. You want a follow-up question? Well, I'd like to know what you mean by a highly developed software. I'd like to hear a little more analysis of that. And uh, when it comes to a prevention plan, I'm not looking for every last detail, but I think you owe us a bit more of an answer. And uh, I'd be happy if you could try and do that.
Wat ik kan zeggen, dat is dat. Wat ik kan tell you is dat. Wat we found, we cleaned up. There are two methods by which we found the malware. We shut off both those channels and we've now stepped up our monitoring, made it more intense than it had been hitherto. The hitch is that uh, as, a, as a telecom operator, We all have the duty to ensure that our networks are protected properly at all times. What we're having to cope with today, and I think this sheds a somewhat different light on this incident, is that there's an intruder here who used extremely sophisticated methods, and clearly has uh, massive resources available. And even if your systems are decently protected, you cannot help but uh, note that you cannot provide a 100% guarantee uh, against someone who has that level of resources and that level of commitment to break into your system managing to do so. And that gives rise to the debate as to how you actually protect your network as a firm. The responsibility for this cannot be laid solely at the door of the firm. Rather, we need an overall approach whereby we take account of all possible measures for prevention and repression of such acts. The directive which you recently adopted regarding uh, network and information security is already a step in the right direction, but we do indeed need to investigate whether locally, nationally and uh, Europe-wide we might not need to provide more resources to the relevant authorities including the uh, surveillance services, the secret services. Much then, Mrs. Morfai, for two minutes. Thank you very much. We are here today because according to the, the press, uh, uh, the, the, the United Kingdom uh, Nas National Security Agency attacked uh, the Belgacom uh, system and thereby violated uh, the rights of you as a firm and uh, your, cost your customers, including European Commission, European Council, European Parliament. Uh, the representatives of uh, uh, Belgacom said that uh, it ha has not been established as a fact that the perpetrator was the British uh, National Security Agency. Of course it wasn't. Uh, as a criminal lawyer, let me tell you that there's nothing surprising about it. That's what criminal proceedings are for, that the perpetrators are going to be found through investigations, through evidence gathering and so on. In modern criminal proceedings, the victim of crime has usually a very strong position. What is your position as Belgacom, as a victim of the crime, and obviously as representing the individual victims, your clients, uh, what is your position in this investigative procedure, and what kind of motions have you made so far in order to, uh, to find the perpetrator, and do you not feel that it's your role as a victim uh, through your lawyers, through your technical specialists, to substantiate or not the, uh, the, the perpetrator's identity. And I ask my colleagues here, why not the European Parliament and the other European entities represented in this procedure, proceedings by lawyers? Uh, backed by technological experts, when we keep talking on other uh, meetings of the European Parliament about victims' rights, uh, fortunately, all the time. And victims' rights are important uh, things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. You have, natuurlijk, groot gelijk wanneer you... Of course, you're quite right. 
in saying that there is a major responsibility here for the for the victims too and that is precisely why we are offering our full cooperation to the legal inquiries underway now if you ask what are your rights as a victim in this procedure we have launched an official complaint as the injured party and that gives us certain rights not at this stage of the investigation but later on once uh, whoever is involved is formally charged then Belgacom will have uh, right to access to the documents so that's how our legal procedures work in Belgium we, we as victims have rights and we fully intend to wield them Ms. Morvai and do you do you feel morally and uh, legally obliged to uh, to sort of collect all your resources in terms of technology all your experts and uh, and all your partners in the international world to to be present in this case i'm very uh, surprised by the way that at this stage of the proceedings you have no rights to make motions and so on it's quite uh, uh, how to say surprising to me and I imagine that there is this prosecutor with the perfect uh, legal knowledge obviously but very little technological knowledge so in this particular case there's a lot of technological knowledge uh, uh, necessary and you have that and your partners have that so you should be uh, very active in, uh, uh, in, in this case I believe don't you, don't you feel so? Absolutely, absolutely ding the bang. Yes indeed I think we do have a huge moral responsibility to ensure that the perpetrators are brought to book. Now, the fact that at this stage of the investigations we don't have um, full access to everything that's going on that is nothing unusual. We will obtain access to the documents at a later stage, so we're not worried about that. What we're doing at this point is offering full cooperation and the external experts that we use for our own internal purposes have been made available to the courts. So we're doing everything we possibly can to help the legal system to bring some clarity into this case. And for our own needs, as well as for our clients and our peers, as you quite rightly point out, we think that is absolutely vital. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have five more requests for the floor, um, but before I get to, to the others, I would like you know, just one clarification. After all the questions and answers, it's still not clear to me, as is reported in the media, whether or not the one who uh, breached the integrity of your system has been able to listen in to telephone calls, yes or no, telephone calls in the European Parliament, yes or no. Because if the answer is yes, then Mrs. Morva is absolutely right that we too are a party in this lawsuit. I can give you a formal assurance that there's been um, no reason to suppose that up until now. Your answer, we'll keep that in mind. Okay, I have five requests for the floor, a um, minute and a half each, because that will allow us to also get proper, uh, proper answers. Um, but I'll, I'll first take three questions and answers, and then two questions and answers. So the first three will be Mrs. Romero Lopez, Mrs. Gomez, and Mr. Klaas, each for a minute and a half. Mrs. Romero Lopez. Thank you. I'd like to ask you whether the virus, the, the malware, which um, people haven't actually named is, is if it's all that sophisticated uh, it would surely be helpful to know exactly what this technology looks like I'd like to know whether the technology they've used to infiltrate your internal systems was to al allow them to um, act without being seen or actually to do they just want to spy you or did they actually want to destroy your systems what was the tense sent behind this malware and if you hadn't noticed it before how long do you think it had actually been working? Ms. Gomez 
First of all, I'd like to also register that I find extremely cynical, disingenuous, and European, and actually anti-European, the answer provided to us by the British representative. It's not about British national security, it's about European security or insecurity. And in other times, had we not the EU, accusations of spying from one power into another would lead to war. This is serious. My question is now, uh, did you, uh, did this attack, this intrusion, really impinge on the privacy beat of your officers in your internal IT uh, systems or your customers, uh, if not by phone, by mail, text messages? What, second question, what was, the, the, in your opinion, the objective of the in intrusion of the, this malware sparing, just spreading the malware maliciously or actually some objective, such as to divert and migrate information from your internal IT systems into other internal IT systems, for instance, located in the GCHQ. Thank you. Mr. Klaas, last one in this round for a minute and a half. Yeah, thank, you, uh, Voorzitter. Okay. thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd also like to make it clear once again that it's unacceptable for uh, Grep to refuse to appear before this committee. Of course, um, security is the responsibility of the Member States, not the European Union, and I'm the last person to contest that state of affairs, but I think it is evidence of cynicism that they're hiding behind the principle of subsidiarity to avoid giving any account of themselves for uh, any hostile act on the part of one Member State against another. Now, my question to Belga Com is this. Will this event lead to a review of your existing procedures? You've called on outside firms to uh, elucidate what's happened. Do you have any plans to make more ex extensive use of these outside firms who appear to have more expertise than, than Belgacom, which uh, is actually something of a scandal in itself? Are you going to get them involved on an on ongoing basis so that you can act more expeditiously whenever instances of malware occur. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, I'm at the tracking to um... Yeah, on the first question on malware. Our hypothesis at the moment is that this malware was not designed to destroy data. We have no indication that the service provision was ever compromised and to date we have no indication that any customer data was compromised. As to how long that malware had been present, at the end of June we managed to establish that the malware was there but the exact date when this uh, first occurred is still part of an ongoing investigation and in technical terms it is a rather complicated affair so at the moment we cannot say anything on that front. The second question concerning the internal privacy. We found no malware on our databases for customer data. We found no malware in our network server. It was just internally. So at the moment we have no indication that the internal privacy should have been violated. As to the reason behind this attack, we can't really draw any conclusions from the facts at the moment. On the revision of current plans, I can say that in, at Belgacom, security is our highest priority. And that means on a, an annual basis, uh, obviously we have a budget, we will continue to professionalise our expertise and this incident meant that we are now better placed to understand how more sophisticated malware works and I have, I'm of the firm conviction that we will come out of this 
crisis, a uh, crisis that we reg regret, but we will come out of this crisis stronger. We will have drawn the lessons. We're already incorporating those lessons in our future plans. And we can say that a number of actions that we had initially planned are going to be speeded up. Okay, everybody. Uh, short follow-up from Mrs. Gomez, but really short. Sorry, I did not get uh, uh, an answer to my question. Was this malware making possible that indeed the data in your internal ITs be copied, transmitted, migrated without uh, damaging them in your ITs to another IT, uh, say, allowing, for instance, I don't know, someone in the GS, uh, GS, uh, GCH who to be listening to, you know, who, the wife of a high official of the EU okay. who is going okay. out. Okay, question is clear. Question is clear. Yeah, there's, that, that you could well, once again, we don't have any factual information that we can draw on to make any statement on that question. Either, we, in other words, we can neither deny nor confirm. But if you could deny, then you could also just say so. Anyway, then I have uh, one last request for the floor because Mr. Schluter has left. Mr. Billet, a minute and a half. Uh, thank you, all, Voorzitter. Uh, and thank you, Chairman. Thank you for allowing uh, your welcome to extend beyond the committee to the history committee. Yes, uh, listening to what you've had to say, we're a bit worried. You're saying that the perpetrator has access to the sort of resources that means there is nothing can be done against them attacking. So in the future that might uh, happen again and all you can do is just clean up ex post. You mentioned that there are national rules that need to be tightened up and maybe at European level that could be done. Maybe you could flesh that out. If I understand correctly, this is only something that we'll be able to resolve at a higher level. And when I say higher level, it's if we join forces. How can that uh, pan out in reality? Are we talking about at the level of your company or f further? Uh, what about the investigative services? secret services, how can we do something at the European level to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again, if that is at all possible? That, uh... Well, indeed, that is an extremely pertinent question, because I think what we can do as a company is to make sure we have an adequate protection of our IT systems, and that's an iterative process. We want to improve in an ongoing way. We draw our, our lessons from what has happened. We exchange uh, views and best practices with other operators. So there are um, structures in place to improve things. What we can note is that today the protection of, the, of economic interests in Europe, if I can put it that way, is not necessarily always the highest priority in as much as the resources which are necessary to make sure we have a decent cyber policy or anti-cyber crime policy be framed, those resources aren't always stumped up to the right extent. And this is something that we as a company uh, and if I'm talking about this, it's a question of an attack of such complexity and such a high level with so many resources behind it. This is something that you as a company, we as a company, on our own cannot resolve. Now, I know that there is no company, no authority in the world who is completely 100% immune or risk-free from this sort of attack. And that's something that we need to bear in mind. And the approach that needs to be pursued means that we do indeed have to consult and, and discuss and cooperate. Of course, we need to have a whole raft of measures from the preventative to the punishments that should be in place. And so there I think we have to have that debate to see what specific measures might be necessary, might be useful for companies, for uh, authorities as well, and even at European level that could be put in place. But as you say, can you 
have an armory against this sort of attack? Well, regrettably, I have to note that there is a level of attack that no single company or authority would be able to um, withstand on their own. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of our session. Um, I have to say, in, in conclusion, I'm actually a bit more puzzled now than I was at the start. So this is a massive attack by an actor who looks very much like a state, or in any case an organization with sufficient resources for a massive attack, but only the internal systems of Belgacom were affected. So why then is it a major incident that has to be reported, and why, if it's only the internal systems, then why can you not deny or confirm that uh, data were migrated? So if you're saying that no telephone calls were intercepted, then why is this more than just an internal Belgacom matter? And why would Belgacom internal systems be the target of a, uh, a, a third country? That, that um, escapes me, but I also understand that there is a lot more that you cannot say because it's all uh, sub judice. Uh, and I hope that in the, in the future uh, we'll get more clarity about this. In any case, we're very grateful that you wanted to come here and give uh, very uh, detailed answers to our questions, and I hope that if in the future there are more questions, we can uh, invite you again. So thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of this part of the session. Then we move on to the second part, and as I said, um, Mr. Loban, the Director of Government Communications Headquarters, otherwise known as GCHQ of the United Kingdom, has declined to come. I think you all got the letter, uh, so you have got the, 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 um, the reasons why. Um, so then we immediately go to Mr. Frank Robben, the, for, of the, um, the uh, uh, Belgian Data Protection Authority called the Commission, la, Commission de la Protection de la Vie Privée Belgique, who is the co-rapporteur on the dossier Belgacom. You have the floor for a short introduction. Yeah, I'll, uh, heel kort zijn. I'll keep this very brief, and now with your request. There are three points I'd like to make. First of all, what we have been doing as the Belgian Privacy Committee, and then perhaps I'll take this opportunity to suggest what lessons you may learn from our work Europe-wide. We, as a Privacy Committee, have been entrusted with the task of establishing whether the security measures um, attached to our systems are adequate keeping track of um, advances in technology and so on. Now, once we were informed of this incident, we enjoyed strong cooperation from Belgacom. We looked into a number of confidential internal documents. And, of course, we uh, respect commercial privacy. I can only confirm that... As soon as the, the facts became known, there was a very professional approach. The proper action was taken to prevent any further damage and to react to the course of events. Everything we've seen up until now suggests that there doesn't appear to have been a, a massive compromising of personal data. So much then for uh, the Belgacom uh, element. Uh, now, moving into a, a European context, if I might be bold enough to make a couple of suggestions, I do hope that you won't um, scare people off ICT. By... Uh, uh, ..attacking on too wide a, a front. Uh, uh, we need ICT in a whole range of sectors. From a number of questions from speakers, I think we can perceive a need to work out a European strategy for cyber security. This isn't something that we should just leave to individual member states. We don't want people ending up in circumstances where they don't really know what's going on. We need a strategy that can be properly implemented Legal steps are one thing, but what's far more important is to ensure that we have a number of operational agreements. We've seen certain patterns of 
malware and so forth. There may be other systems being attacked at present with the same patterns. We ought to be able to tackle them more effectively. As Mr. Ballett had said, you, you need to package your measures. If you ever want a, a solution, if you really want to find out where the attack is coming from, then we need proper technological competence to be able to analyse what's going on. I don't think we have enough in Belgium on our own to um, have the best chance of success. We as a national privacy body don't have that much prospect of being able to call upon highly sophisticated uh, technologies to investigate exactly w what is going on. And that's why I would put it to you, we had an opportunity to discuss this with the, with the, um, the, the chair on an earlier occasion, please do focus on the international element. Please concentrate on those things that cannot be best done by the member states. There are certainly uh, certain security issues that can be resolved nationally, but on those problems which uh, roam beyond national borders, this cybercrime, we, we do need effective action. We, we don't have any European bodies at present who are able to take effective, prompt action with adequate tools up until now. I'll be happy to field any questions there may be. So that brings us to our rapporteur for two minutes, Mr. Moraes. Uh, thanks, Mr. Robin, for coming. Could, I don't know if I um, picked that up correctly, but um, you seem to be fairly dismissive of the Belgacom investigation. You have the powers, perhaps, to look into the investigation. Um, can you give us some more information as to what powers you actually have and to how in-depth your investigation can actually be. This session, just to remind everyone, needed to have Sir Ian Loban or a representative from UCREP to, to build a, um, a circumstantial case for all of us. We don't have subpoena powers. We rely on people to cooperate with us. Um, this inquiry just depends on cooperation. So we needed to have two sides of the story. Our colleagues from Belgacom can simply give us um, the information that they want to give us in terms of cooperation. But on their side, they have a prima facie case because they've given a case to prosecutors. That means there is a case. For, now, we don't have the extra part of the jigsaw, which is the British part of it, because we don't have Sir Ian Laban and we don't have any representatives of UCREP, so we don't have a British part of it. We also put you into this session because uh, we felt that there was some element of investigation uh, from Belgium, an extra independent part of the investigation. So please tell us if you have any powers here or if you have any um, thoughts on what you think of the Belgacom case, any, any ideas of where you think the case is going. Um, we understand you want to talk about the wider issues of cyber security, but give us your impressions of what you think is happening here. Um, I think I heard you say that you didn't think there was a, a big um, data protection um, issue here, a big cyber threat. Um, I'm not sure if my colleagues heard that, but um, please just expand on that and give us your, your overall view. Okay, so, so as said. Well, as I was saying, I'm in the Belgian Privacy Commission, and it's our remit to investigate whether personal data particularly citizens' and customers' personal data, were compromised. And we have no power to investigate where the attacks come from and what exactly happened. But on the basis of the information we've obtained, and we had access to all the necessary documents and systems, I can confirm that on the basis of our current knowledge, there are no indications that citizens or Belgacom customers' data were massively at, uh, attacked or illegally transferred. The personal data doesn't appear to have been taken. Uh, apart from that, there are other bodies, the 
the courts and the, the security services who can deal with this. But that's not our role. What we have to do is establish whether citizens and Belgacom clients' uh, data were compromised. And as I say, as things stand today, w w that appears not to be the case. Well, uh, I didn't want to misunderstand your role. I just wanted to to just confirm that we'd invited you because you would have given us that extra dimension of independent scrutiny and an answer on whether you felt independently that Belgian citizens had been compromised. You've given us your answer. Um, I, can, I can see that it's caused a little bit of confusion and consternation. Well, at least I can speak for myself. Um, but um, you've given us your answer, so that's mine. Okay, for the EPP, Mr Voss, for two minutes. As far as I've understood this, citizens aren't yet affected. We should therefore concentrate on international aspects. In the context of this whole NSA PRISM affair and the United Kingdom, it may be that we haven't got any information as yet but there, in my view, must be an international dimension. If you have certain notions about the international aspects, what are those international aspects? What uh, sort of measures are envisioned? Uh, can we deduce that customers are affected and what might lie behind all this? Ik heb het al voor een stuk uh, aangegeven. Hè. Ik denk. Well, I think I, I said this to a degree that we, as a national control organ, we are in place to note that we can do our job in this particular sphere. But I think it is absolutely necessary. As I've already said, these are extremely complicated viruses, encryption technologies which at national level are difficult to decipher. And you have to decipher them to know what they actually do. If you need that level of competence and knowledge, then that's not something that any old member state could do. It means that there has to be some sort of European competence competency uh, center to do that. You know, if there's an attack on Belga, Belgacom, you know, there might be an attack somewhere else. Uh, it could be the same same sort of attack. You can see the patterns that, it, uh, that emerge um, because of malware being used, but if it only happens at Belgian level, then you can't really do that. So measures need to be taken to make sure that if there are these sort of attacks, that we know that there may be other forms of uh, system that are attacked. So it's absolutely necess necessary that there be competences found at the European level and that there be an exchange of information. And we need to inform each other and exchange information to be able to make headway. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, I, I will now speak as a shadow for the Alder Group. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm getting increasingly confused by this hearing, having listened to Belgacom and having listened to the, uh, the Privacy uh, Commission. We're talking here about a massive attack, very sophisticated, I'm using your words, by a state actor that has massive means. It couldn't be just any country. It really, it, it's, it's, it's massive, very sophisticated. However, Everything is fine because there was no interception of phone calls. Um, your clients were defected. It was just the internal system. No data have been siphoned off. And yet, and yet there is a criminal case which is secret. So, you know, it's either one or the other. Either there is a major incident here, a major incident which indeed justifies um, uh, the uh, a criminal case which justifies this hearing and which justifies much further investigations, or it's just a minor incident inside Belgacom. It cannot both be true. It is not credible that the media are reporting about something like this and they've made it all up. 
it cannot be all, you know, just their imagination and there being a criminal case and you saying everything is fine. This is simply not credible. And I'm very surprised at the, um, the attitude of the, the Belgian Data Protection Authority. I understand that you don't have the powers to investigate who was behind this and what their motives were. But to actually say, oh, well, everything is fine and we just need European uh, you know, legislation to, to tighten up our systems. No, if this is not a massive attack, if everything is not true, then we can just you know, conclude this session and all go for a beer. But if it is true, then we need some more answers than what we got today. Als ik daar even kan op reageren. Well, perhaps I can come in here. Tot heden is. Uh... To date. Well, until this attack on Belgacom. Belgacom had always been in a position to defend itself against attacks on its system and had never been compromised. Now we have a case where we found uh, malware on 128 systems of ours. All we can say here today is on the basis of facts, and that's what we've tried to do. We know in the press there have been a lot of rumours, but a lot of them were based on hypotheses that were unsubstantiated. We can only base ourselves on the facts, and the facts to date do not give any indication that any information from our customers was passed on to the hacker. Now, of course, there's a further technical investigation going on, and we're involved with that. Many other agencies and bodies involved as well. And uh, as Dirk said, we are providing every assistance to those people, but we can only express ourselves on the basis of fact today. So it is a serious attack on our integrity, yes, because it's the first time ever that malware has managed to penetrate into our internal systems. Follow-up question then. If I could just briefly uh, get back to you on this. Yes, it is a serious attack. But because there was rapid reaction, the impact of this attack was not considerable. I think that's clear. So then my short follow-up question to both of you would be, you know, what could there possibly be in the internal systems of Belgacom, the internal administration, I suppose, that is of such interest to, a, um, you know, to the British Secret Service or any Secret Service? Uh, yeah, maar daar, daar opnieuw, uh... Well, once again, we can proffer various hypotheses, but I'm not in a position to give any opinion on those hypotheses. Today, the, uh, as of today, there is no proof or indication what the target of that cyber attack was. So it's unclear. Mr. Yeah. Robin? I have nothing to add. Okay, thank you. Um, that brings us to Mr. Albrecht for the Greens. Thank you. Um, Mr. Robin, I, uh, I'm a bit puzzled by your answers. Uh, also, I mean, the way how you try to say that everything is perfect, because, uh, I mean, we are in the middle of a crisis with regard to the application of privacy and data protection legislation also in Belgium, and you know about it. It's about the question of circumvention of Belgian rule of law and data protection laws. Uh, and I think you should be a bit more concerned as a member of the uh, Privacy Commission in Belgium, and I, don't, uh, I do not hope that this is uh, the attitude generally in the DPA in Belgium. Um, my question, you rightly called for uh, consequences needed on the European level for the investigative powers uh, to investigate these incidents. Um, did the Belgian authorities, including the Belgian DPA, involve the E3, uh, EC3, the Europol Cybercrime Centre, into these incidents and ask for their help, which is exactly what you called for. We spent millions to do exactly that on the European level. So the question is, did the Belgian authorities ask for the help of such the centre 
And why did the Belgian DPA and the Belgian authorities didn't do if that wasn't the case? Mr. <coughs> I think that we're perfect. I think that we're playing our role perfectly. I've told you that the role of the Privacy Commission is to check whether the personal data were compromised on the basis of all the information made available to us today and we were able to look at all the, the measures, all the audit reports that were prepared. It does not appear that citizens' personal data have been compromised. I told you that very clearly. Now there is an investigation underway. We're trying to establish where the attack came from, what was passed on and so on. You, you need very sophisticated um, decrypting technology for that. Now, there's, there's something for the Belgian and conceivably the international authorities to do on this. That's not our role as the Privacy Commission. Just like other Privacy Commissions, our remit is con uh, confined to establishing whether data protection legislation has been respected or not. And we believe that the steps taken by Belgacom to protect the system were good. The measures taken whenever problems occur were right and proper and they've used all due diligence to ensure that uh, attacks do not lead to citizens or clients' uh, data being improperly transferred. That's the role and uh, we've been doing the job properly. No, I, I, I just, uh, I mean, I, I just asked myself how, how you can completely exclude that uh, in, in these cases uh, personal data are completely outside. I, uh, I really ask myself, I mean, you can have, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, indices, indices or indications uh, for that. But I, I don't think that if you don't know about which data have been compromised, how could you exclude that personal data were part of it? I, I don't understand it, really. Mr. Robin? I can't exclude that, as things are today. The, the data was transferred uh, under encryption. We, we can't decipher that at, at present, but we, we can see how much data was transferred. It, and it emerges from that that it wasn't a massive transfer. If you ever want to establish what data was compromised, we would need very sophisticated de decryption techniques. Otherwise, we'll never find out. If, if we want to, to crack into this sophisticated in encryption and find out exactly what was taken. You, you need the necessary skills to do that. And you need really very highly qualified specialist um, skills to do that. But from the, um, the figure available, we've no indication that there was a massive transfer of data from citizens or, or customers. As I say, that's on the basis of the information available to us today. I can't give you a 100% guarantee, no, but we have very clear indications that there wasn't that massive data transfer. Um, the, the steps were taken by Velgacom. Absent, uh, Mrs. Ernst, on behalf of GUI, for two minutes. Yeah, uh, vielen Dank. Yes, thank you. I would just like to uh, update what sets were affected. You said no individual company can protect itself. Uh, so that was a sentence you said. And you also said national data protection agencies have little opportunity to uh, establish what has happened and we need some sort of European level facility. Can I ask you directly? At present, can technology be used to fend off these high-tech cyber attacks? How secure is Belgacom? That would be my question. And is the privacy of telecoms guaranteed at all? P 
purely from the technological perspective. That's my first point. The second point, let me look at it from the other way around and ask what audits of security and Belgacom have been carried out and at what interval and what were the findings and when was the last time and moreover who is carrying out the audits is it an independent body or something else and what would you intend to do in respect of their conclusions and if internal IT systems have been affected and I've read in Spiegel about uh, colleagues uh, involved uh, have they been affected surely uh, there are people within your internal systems who might have been affected have you detected anything in that direction I will allow Belga come to address the, the factual points but uh, frankly I, I don't think you can avoid this 100% uh, you know if software d doesn't have elements built into it to prevent uh, backdoors and uh, don't forget that there are that there are rules and regulations in, in the the US which um, stipulate backdoors you're familiar with that uh, so we have no guarantee that those um, problems aren't going to be there you have to carry out proper checks, but we, we can't completely exclude the possibility that, that software from outside firms contains um, backdoors. We, we can't rule that out. What we can do is adopt the necessary steps to look carefully at the risks, keep an eye on the level of technology, and um, keep the risk to the, the barest minimum. But th there is no cast iron guarantee. Uh, on the other points, perhaps I could hand over to Belgacom. Uh, May I just confirm once again that sec securing our network is a, a primary concern for us. So we are w working on fresh measures to be a, a step ahead of potential attackers. We've been partially successful. I'm, I'm thinking of some of the cyber attacks that have been launched, vendetta attacks in the past. We've managed to fend those off. As for the standards, we are up to the mark with the international um, ISF standards and our data centres, as far as security is concerned, do enjoy ISO certification. So every now and then we get uh, external auditors in to check the security system and then we have benchmarks with a number of labs around Europe, a number of uh, operators around Europe, and we, and we have an ethical forum. The benchmarks look at all the, the various elements of security. There's more to it than just the architecture of the system, the technology. It also in, involves the kind of actions you, you take, the governance processes, the culture within any given company. And um, of course, um, we learn from the benchmarks and, and feed our findings into our further work. We are going to be beefing up all our measures. And so we have our own IT infrastructure in house, but we also have an external one uh, which provides service to our customers. Now, where the weak link was that, that let the attack into our system is not yet known. Are we acting differently now? Yes, indeed. We said that we're, we're taking a range of additional measures. We're, we're going to be stepping up our monitoring. We've undertaken that. A technical report is being prepared now which the Belgacom management team will receive at the end of this month. And they're going to try and learn the lessons of this crisis, and we will emerge strengthened from that.
thank you for that. Then, uh, to conclude the round of shadows, I now count Mrs. Moravai as a shadow for the, the non-aligned for two minutes. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the, um, to the representative of the Belgian uh, Privacy uh, Commission for, for coming here. I'm so embarrassed that I, I might have uh, misunderstood you, and I would like to clarify. It seems that you are saying that, on the one hand, it's clear that there was a major attack on uh, the Belgian telecom company. But on the other hand, there was no harm done to, uh, to the customers. So this is not a case for you. This is not something for you to, uh, uh, to deal with. And I was thinking about a parallel while you were speaking, that if somebody is shooting to the direction of a person and the bullet misses the person, uh, then would either the victim support agency or the police say, well, why bother? I mean, what, what, what's wrong here? There was, nothing has happened. Uh, the, the, the victim didn't have any harm. Uh, maybe he or she should protect herself a little bit more from now on. I don't think that that would happen. It would be considered as an attempted murder or an attempted uh, assault or something. So it's still a crime. So why is it not considered as such? And I have another uh, point uh, to make, and that is that it seems that the, the Belgian authorities, especially the Belgian prosecutor service, definitely needs help in this investigation. And I think that uh, the Libe Committee and our inquiry proceeding is in the position of helping. There is a very important witness in this case, and it uh, appears that it, uh, he was not heard yet by the prosecution for reason unknown to us. It's quite obvious that Edward Snowden knows a lot about this uh, case. Uh, why don't we invite Edward Snowden to, to talk about this case uh, through Skype? We would tape uh, whatever he says and submit it uh, to the Belgian prosecution as an evidence to be considered, to be dealt with. And from then on, that, they would be in a much easier situation. And I think it's such a nice feeling to help others. Uh, so why don't we do that? Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think that's an excellent suggestion. I'm sure Belgacom would like to provide a secure Skype connection with Mr. S Mr. Snowden. <laughs> Mr. Robin. Yeah, sorry, as I misschien on... Well, I apologize if I've been unclear. There's a, a legal case, a legal investigation ongoing, and they're going to look into what happened, who perpetrated the, the crimes, and what the punishment will be, will be. Alongside that, there's a privacy committee that has no legal powers, has no uh, role to play, cannot Im impose sanctions on that front. Um, but in terms of the way in which personal data has been used or abused, whether there's been an abuse also of privacy regulations or legislation, and to see whether we can find a better way of improving privacy protection. Those are two separate things. You have a legal um, investigation and you have the Privacy Committee looking into things and following things up. In the Privacy Committee, we've, we're looking into whether uh, private data has been compromised. We believe that is not the case, given the evidence we have at the moment. And looking at the security measures that the Belgacom took and additional measures they've taken since to avoid this in the future, we believe those to be sufficient. We've had a look to see whether the measures that Belgacom took at the time when the incident became, they became aware of the incident, whether it was uh, sufficient action they took, and we believe that was the case. All the rest is left up to the legal investigation where the, the, the Belgian courts have to deal with this. You don't, you haven't invited anybody from the judiciary, you've invited somebody from the Privacy commi Commission, uh, and I'm giving that answer as somebody from the Privacy Commission, uh, and I'm only there to see if there's been an abuse of privacy legislation. There's nobody from the, the Belgian uh, criminal uh, investigation, and by the way, it's a pending case, so it's sub judice anyway, uh, you know, as to what the criminal case is and who did it. We, we don't have anybody there. I hope I have been clear between the two parallel investigations that are ongoing at the moment. Another question? Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to, to clarify whether you consider this as a 
privacy case as an important case of, uh, of uh, violation of privacy, and maybe the data uh, of, uh, of customers was not actual, were not actually uh, compromised, but at least they were endangered. And maybe I am not very familiar with the, um, with the rules and regulations about your commission, and that's why I'm mistaken. But I have the feeling that it should be a case for you, because if your commission's role is to protect the privacy of people in, in, in Belgium, then if, uh, if such a major, major endangerment of the privacy of people took place, then it should be a case for you. And, uh, and that's it. Okay, I don't want to take more time. We beschouwen dit als een zeer... Well, we don't see it as a very serious uh, abuse, but we do think that it is uh, a, a case that proven that it's more or less there's a degree of safety there because there are no uh, indications that there's been an abuse of any privacy uh, issues. Uh, yes, there is a, a case to answer, but not for us to look into. There doesn't appear to be any uh, uh, compromising of Belgacom's customers' data. Or I, I've got three more requests for the floor, but I'll first give the floor to the rapporteur who has an additional question. I just want to make a quick question to Mr. Robin and to also acknowledge that we do understand that you, the limitations that you have you're from the privacy element, and we understand we didn't invite somebody from the judiciary and any, any other organ. So let me ask you, um, are you aware of any other element of the Belgian infrastructure, judiciary, or anyone else who's um, accessed the European Cybercrime Centre, for example? Because a theme is emerging here that we set up the European Cybercrime Centre within Europol to exactly deal with this situation, and we are seeing an emerging situation here, all of my colleagues, that no one is accessing this, no member state is making this complaint, nobody is using this infrastructure. This is a theme that is, that is a common denominator in every hearing that we have. So although you are in this section, you understand the infrastructure in Belgium, we're not subpoenaing you, we're asking you to come here in, in cooperation. So tell us from your knowledge, is anyone else accessing the European Cybercrime Centre, or does they, do they want to access it? That's what it's there for. Please tell us, and, it, and if not, why not? Well, I can't speak on behalf of the Belgian Secret Services to look into this. Uh, presumably they would take up contacts there if necessary, uh, and I haven't asked for that to be done, but uh, I think you need to look at the level of competence here, uh, looking at the, the European level, and that's maybe something you should be looking at. Okay, so um, I have Mr. Albrecht, point of order. I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I just would like to note that obviously uh, just now there's a confirmation that there are some log files that is uh, confirmed by some journalists, which deliver quite clearly that it's the EC, uh, GCHQ and that it's British uh, origin, uh, the attack. So, I mean, uh, I don't know if, if you have known about this before, but I would have expected that if this uh, is becoming true, that there's at least also uh, from the side of the Belgian authority more openness and more uh, direct answers You're to our questions. The question, are you asking Belgacom to confirm this or the, the Privacy Commissioner? Uh, I mean, both. Uh, okay, both. It's, it's up we to you if you want to say something on that, but I just re refer to it, and I mean, it's, it's okay. disappointing but if you, we just you... get at the end of our meeting such a confirmation uh, by journalists. Okay, I'm going to ask the, both Belga from the Privacy Commission to answer to that very briefly, and then we get to our last three um, questions. Well, as uh, what the journalist... If what the journalists are saying is right, and it is indeed uh, disappointing that they get information before Belgacom itself. But I must say that as things stand now, we have no indication as to who might be behind this attack. 
Give me an example to vous qu'on aurait. I have nothing to add to that. We don't have that information. Okay. Um, Mrs. I'm going to give the floor to Mrs. Sipple, Mrs. Gomez, Mrs. Romero Lopez, each for a minute and a half. We'll round up your three questions and then we'll come back. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I think the last debate was a little odd. Today we've heard numerous times that these attacks. must have required tremendous uh, technological and other resources and a single company couldn't have done this. So who else but a security service could have done it? Please answer that. And if it wasn't a private company but a security service, then many legal and data protection questions are lost from sight uh, because a security service wouldn't uh, take those into consideration. So who then can put in place the necessary facilities to fend off such attacks if the security services of the member states themselves are involved in the attacks? Uh, then there is no customer or personal data involved, but can we exclude, given the tremendous resources brought to bear, to hack into uh, Belgacom's internal systems that information could have been obtained. Otherwise, why would they have made the effort? And perhaps in the medium term, this information will be used uh, to infringe uh, human rights or uh, the situation of companies, including telecoms companies. So those are my questions. Robin, you have said that you don't have evidence of any massive transfer of data. Uh, but do you have evidence of any selective transfer or copy or occasional monitoring of data, say, of my phone conversations or of, of the message of that myself or Mr. Zorobojo sent to our grandchildren? I think this is uh, indeed a very important precision. It's not about massive data, it's selective, occasional monitoring. And uh, a, a suggestion, if nobody is actuating the investigation by Europol and European Cybercrime Center, why don't we? I am a Belgacom customer. I have, I'm ready to do it. I'm afraid you're not a member state, Mrs. Gomez. <laughs> Mrs. Romero Lopez for a minute and a half. Gracias. Thank you. In our committee, on earlier occasions, we discussed the importance of uh, encryption in deciphering labs. Now, I'd like to know which labs are working on this in, in Belgium. Where is the encryption and, and deciphering going on in Belgium? They bear such a heavy responsibility. We ought to know who they are. And then surely they, they should have special certification so that we can establish whether their skills are commensurate with that responsibility. How do they actually carry out their work? Are they the same plans being used by the Americans? That's information we ought to have. Okay, we have uh, three questions now. I'm going to ask Mr. Robin to answer first and then I'll come back to Belga in, in case they want to respond. Yeah, ik zal, uh, kort zijn. I'll keep it brief. I'll take it in reverse order. Now, regarding encryption, I, I mentioned the point that information which has been transferred. It's, it's not a question of encryption by uh, Belgacom. It, it's this sophisticated technology being used for the, the attack uses uh, encryption. So y you have to be able to carry out decryption to know exactly what data had been compromised. That, that's, that's the problem. They use these encryption techniques 
But if you want to find out, you've got to be able to reverse the process. And that does imply a high level of technological knowledge. So it's not a question of of um, Belcom having done a bad job with encryption. It's, it's, it's all the work of the malware. Now, I acknowledge that on the basis of current information, we don't know exactly what may or may not have been compromised, but on the basis of the information available to us today, we have no indication that personal data has been compromised to any great extent. There may be some selective data, there may be some personal data involved, but on the basis of what we've been told up until now and on the basis of Belgacom's inquiries, it doesn't appear that there's been any massive transfer of um, in customers' information from our country. We're fairly confident about that. Somebody from Belgacom? Well, I can merely confirm that as things stand today, we have no facts to indicate that um, such transfer took place. We can see that, of course, a certain amount of information uh, has been removed from uh, back doors and, and it's been encrypted. What the target was is something that we hope we will be able to work out following further investigations. As to who carried out the intrusion, on the basis of our information, this appears to have been particularly sophisticated software. In order to, to develop that, you need significant resources. But who exactly is behind all this is something which, up until now, we have no solid information on. That's it. Thank you very much. Well, you know, if it is indeed GCHQ, then they should have the expertise to help you out and decrypt. Mrs. Morva, you have a point of order. Real Thank point of order or a political point? Do, do you have any problem with politics, Madam Chair? I thought I you no were a politician no, and I was a politician. So I very much hope that we both believe in yep. politics. Yep, point of order. Uh, I just want to follow up on the, on the uh, point of order of Mr. Albrecht uh, that I think uh, it seems that, uh, that uh, whatever evidence uh, uh, journalists and whistleblowers provide through the press is considered to be just rumors. So why don't we provide a space and a framework for elevating the so-called rumors to the level of evidence? And as I said in the uh, case of Snowden as a witness, we can do it with all pieces of evidence in this Bergacom case and then tape it and present it to the prosecution service. It would not be exceeding our authority, okay. but still a good way of helping the proceedings, the criminal proceedings. We, in I'm sure that if we can get hold of that kind of evidence, we will indeed submit it to the prosecutor. I'm going to ask uh, our rapporteur to make some concluding remarks. Well, first of all, Chair, the um, the big political conclusions are going to be made at the end of this inquiry, but I think for the time being, I want to thank our witnesses because um, they're not forced to come here. We're not subpoenaed. You come here um, through cooperation, and they at least said that a prima facie case was made. Now, because a prima facie case was made by Belgacom to the uh, Belgian prosecutors in a sophisticated legal system, that means a case was made. And that means that we have to make assumptions about what that case was. We didn't make any progress on what the detail of that case was. And we can only make assumptions, as you can. Uh, but as politicians, we have to make our assumptions. We couldn't complete the circumstantial evidence because we didn't have the other side of that allegation, which was the British representatives. So we were hampered in that case. And we didn't complete um, the case um, of an independent analysis from the Belgian authorities because there were limitations to that evidence. But we can make a number of assumptions. For example, uh, we, are, we are fast learning uh, that member states are not accessing the European Cybercrime Centre, for example, and all sorts of issues which are becoming very clear to us uh, on this committee. So I'm not going to make the final political conclusions, but I think this was a very useful uh, session because we made... Uh, we asked many pertinent questions. Of course, we didn't get 
the clear answers, but I think we assumed that we wouldn't uh, reach many of those conclusions. So I'm going to leave the um, concluding remarks there. And I want to thank every uh, member who stayed on this Thursday afternoon uh, to ask those questions and everyone listening on the web stream. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I too, uh, from the chair, I would like to, to thank our guest speakers. And, um, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it's nothing personal if we made your life difficult this afternoon. At the same time, I also have to say that I think we're, we're all coming away with more questions than, than answers, which is not necessarily your fault, but I think it's frustrating. We don't have full uh, powers of inquiry and, and the powers to hear people under oath. However, um, I, you know, I'd be curious to know uh, if the Belgian parliament intends to hold a full parliamentary inquiry and ask you the same questions uh, under oath, because indeed there, I mean, there is a number of discrepancies here in this case uh, saying we don't really know what happened, we don't really know who did it, we know it's massive, but only the internal systems were affected. Therefore, all the reports in the media are pure uh, speculation, but um, there, there, there must be some basis, I would say. Um, okay, that leaves me um, with the only um, communication that the next inquiry meeting is next Monday, October 7th at 7 o'clock. The topic will be Safe Harbour and this meeting is in Strasbourg. So thank you all for being here. I'm really happy that at least the reporters and some of the votes for coming because 